Hi, I'm Pastor Chad. On behalf of the people at IHBC, I'm praying that you're blessed by this video. We're a people who know that God loves us and that it's His intent to shape us both through the truth of His Word and also in our fellowship together. If you're in the Silver City area, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to come out and join us. It would be our joy to get to know you. We know that Jesus stands with arms open, ready to receive you, and so do we. You'll find our church on the east edge of town, and you can see our flag on the side of 180. And now, we're praying you'll be blessed by this teaching from God's Word. All right. Well, how wonderful is this, guys? Honestly, after not being able to be together, is it not wonderful to be able to gather together and worship? Amen. And what a blessing to know that God is a good Father, that He is always, always raising up and calling new people in new places to Himself to give Him praise that He will be glorified. And it's such a comfort to have the reassurance of knowing that our faithfulness, our worship, our service, it's all part of something that is so much bigger and so far beyond ourselves. It's something that started long, long ago, long before us, and goes on forever and ever, and we have the opportunity and the privilege to be a part of it for eternity. And for the last three months, suffice it to say, we've been in strange times. We have all been living with the effects of a virus to the extent that we are, many of us in many cases at this point, truly tired of hearing about it. So I bring it up again. But the effects on our lives are tangible, whether it's impacted us personally or by proxy, the reach of the effects have thoroughly made their way into our midst and remain unavoidable. I mention it this morning only to point out just how thoroughly a biological, physical, medical virus can completely disrupt our way of life. It can disrupt so many good things, can instill so much fear, can steal away our joy and truly has, at least temporarily, robbed us of our normal. And there is this great desire, this great hunt, this great willing in all of us to see this virus and its effects end, or to see the restoration to the way that things are supposed to be. Simultaneously, we are in these more recent weeks seeing it stoke the effects of a greater human affliction. That is the virus of sin a ruthless, contaminating corruption that has afflicted us all. The infection, sin, is no respecter of persons, shows no partiality, it cannot be escaped, and we have seen the effects of sin manifest in our streets and in our news cycle, in our government, in our political spheres, and even in our families and in our churches. And it's killing us. Our nation, our relationships, even you and I individually, in a very tangible spiritual sense, if it goes unchecked, it will kill us. During this season in which there's a tremendous desire to see a rescue from the viral affliction of COVID-19, to see a cure or an end to this passing physical virus and a return to life without its effects, we have yet to really see or to witness or to experience a sweeping concern among the masses for the deeper virus of sin. A greater concern to seek out the God-appointed hospitals or the God-ordained cure for the brokenness and malady that afflicts our hearts and that drives us to be less human, less humane, and into further darkness every day. Historically, in many cases, events like the one that we're presently going through, they've resulted in a great movement of people toward God. They attune our senses toward the spiritual. They rouse us to alertness. They cause us to examine our existence and lead us to question our priorities and to ponder our morality. But for many months, the churches in our nation sat entirely empty. Many of the larger ones today still do. And among those that are now open, they appear in most cases to be half full at best. And while the great malady of sin, it wreaks havoc in our land, in our streets, and in our homes. Where does this go? Where does it end? 
after 9-11, there are stories of great revival. Tim Keller, a well-known pastor today, he came to prominence in New York's post-9-11 church boom. He tells the story of how in the week following 9-11, the smoke from downtown, it was visible everywhere. The air felt thick and it completely unclean to breathe and the smell, it hung in the air for weeks. Everyone had just witnessed the burning towers collapse and on the very first Sunday after 9-11, the church, it immediately doubled in size. This was the case for churches all across New York. Nearly half of all the evangelicals that exist in New York today have opened in the years since 9-11. John MacArthur tells a similar story. When one of the massive earthquakes hit Southern California, people immediately packed the church and many came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Like we've seen so many times before, trying times, national tragedies, moments of great unrest, natural disasters, and earthquakes, times when the earth shakes, bring great movements of people toward Christ. But at this moment, for many months, the churches in our nation have sat mostly empty, and the earth is quaking. God is shaking the earth that the removing of what can be shaken will fall away so that what cannot be shaken remains. I will shake all the nations and they will come with all their treasures and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. But at this moment, the churches still remain mostly empty. And I think perhaps the reason that we're yet to see an influx of people recognizing the affliction of their sin, roused to life, drawing near to Christ to seek him who is himself the cure, is because the earth has yet to cease its shaking. In many ways, these days, days which have become weeks and weeks which are becoming months, they're yet to offer us a reprieve from the present storm. People are still wrestling to find their bearings and Many are still struggling to get back on their feet while the whole earth still shakes. And I believe we are in the midst of a monumental moment in which the whole earth is trembling. It's being roused from a great slumber of easy contentment to an awareness and a spiritual alertness, at an alertness of the deep unhealthiness that has been resting just beneath the surface of our superficial security being exposed. Many, I think, are just waking up to this reality and Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. So it's a perfect time for us to return then to Jesus' teaching. And it's an interesting thing to observe that here we sit in the midst of his calling and for many months there has been no altar. And even now, so many who need to hear and respond to the call of Christ and come forward and give their lives to him, they're not yet here. The church doesn't sit empty this Sunday, thanks be to God, but for good and understandable reasons, the people are not yet here, and Jesus is calling. It's the tradition in evangelical churches in the South, as I know you are well aware that the proclamation of the word of God, it's concluded with a call for a response. The sermon, it concludes with an altar call, the invitation is what we often call it. The scripture itself, it calls for a response and good preaching then is always done with the intent that it elicit a response. A call to leave the world behind, to abandon old lifestyles, to forsake sin, a call to recognize the malady of the sin that's corrupting our mortal flesh and to turn from our own way, and to seek life in Jesus. The scripture calls us to respond. Therefore, a sermon gives an invitation to arise, to rise from sleepy contentment, and false security, and sin, to arise from the clutches of death, and to follow Jesus. But even within our own tradition, even within so many evangelical churches, so many Southern Baptist churches, biblically conservative, sound, good, strong churches, Many sermons end without an invitation. I was raised up in churches that didn't give an invitation. Why? Is it because we don't think the people will respond? Or 
or is it something else? Jesus knew they would. In fact, that's how Jesus begins his ministry, commanding a response. In Matthew 4, when Jesus begins his ministry, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. A couple verses later, verse 19, when Jesus calls his first disciples, he says to them, Follow me. And immediately, they abandoned what they were doing and followed him. Jesus calls for a response. That's what we're going to see him doing in the text this morning in the scripture. If you were with us back before all the corona craziness started, you can remember back that far, then you know we were studying Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. We left off in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus is drawing his famous sermon to a close. This morning, I think it's time we go back. We're going to return to the Gospel of Matthew, to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where we're going to see Jesus wrap up his sermon by giving his altar call. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. Not everyone who knows the name of the Lord, who declares the name of the Lord, or even takes the name of the Lord, will enter in, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. So open your Bibles with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 12, and hear the words of our Lord there. Jesus says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is the word of the Lord. There's a lot happening in this passage. Honestly, this passage, it could be broken down further into separate sections, and we could talk about the golden rule. We could talk about the wolves in sheep's clothing, and we could talk about how you'll know a person by their fruit. This morning, I want to hold all these verses together, and I want to show you on a larger scale what Jesus is doing here. Literarily, that is, in terms of construction, this passage is masterful. If you spend time breaking it down, diagramming this passage, what you'll find here is that Jesus, he has bookended this passage on each side. On the one side, up front in verse 12, saying, this is what's righteous. In God's sight, this, the golden rule, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, is lawful. On the other side, at the end of the passage, in verse 23, he says, These examples I've just laid out for you, false teaching, deceit, bearing bad fruit, seeking one's own glory through spiritual gifts and mighty works, rather than loving others and loving God, doing the will of the Father, this is lawlessness. Between these two bookends, in verses 12 and 23, Jesus says, reject lawlessness, which is godlessness, even when it poses as Christian, and enter by the narrow gate. Jesus says, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus is setting up a comparison between the lawful, those who do the will of the Father, they do his will by living in the righteousness of Christ, and the lawless, who instead 
seek for self. In the first book, in book in one, Jesus says, this is the law and the prophets. Jesus says, do this. This is lawful in God's sight. Do unto others. This is what the law and the prophets command. And in much of the Sermon on the Mount, the bulk of Jesus' teaching, it walked us through examples of what it looks like to seek this kind of behavior from a heart level righteousness. He said, don't just avoid murder, but forgive and avoid anger. He said, don't just avoid adultery, but avoid lust. Don't merely keep your oaths, but be a faithful and honest person in heart. Be true to your word. Don't retaliate. Be long-suffering. Don't just love those who love you, but love your enemies. Be open-handed, generous, not anxious about possessions. Give to the needy. Be concerned for the log in your own eye before you rush to judge others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the summation of the law and the prophets. And it seems, I think, in my experience anyway, like many people like this notion. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In our culture, I think most of us, we readily adopt this notion, even espouse it. But I think few of us, few people, truly understand it or practice it in the way that Jesus is really commanding. I think most people do unto others in the expectation of some sort of a reciprocal exchange that we're going to have. Like a deal we make with ourselves, I'm going to treat you with love and kindness so long as you treat me with the same. And in the flesh, we have this kind of agreement that as long as this mutual exchange takes place, as long as both sides are doing this, as long as we are both responding in kind, both treating one another the way that we want to be treated, we will honor this commandment. But then when people don't respond in this manner, when people don't treat us the way that we want to be treated, well, then this commitment, treating others the way that we want to be treated, it kind of goes out the window. People love one another, respect one another, are kind to one another on the condition that that kindness and respect is returned. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you until the other person doesn't do as you would like them to do, and then it's over. That's not what Jesus commands. We see this all the time. It manifests itself in things like, I will respect the governing authorities until I disagree with them. I will honor my leaders until they do something I don't like. I will love my spouse until I can't get along with her. I'll be kind to my neighbor so long as my neighbor honors me. That's not what Jesus says. And you hear things like respect isn't given, it's earned. Or respect or marriage or a relationship is a two-way street. It's not what Jesus says. It's completely counter to Jesus and his teaching. Because Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the summation of the law and the prophets. But Jesus never promised that doing unto others as you would have them do unto you will result in them actually doing unto you in that way and treating you in the way that you would like. It's promised just the opposite, actually. Jesus has just said in this very sermon, Sermon on the Mount, when you honor the law and the prophets, when you honor Christ, when you do what is lawful in God's sight, you will be treated in ways that you do not want. Chapter 5. Beginning in verse 10, you will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How are you going to keep the law and the prophets and not be treated like the prophets? Jesus says, when you honor my will, you're commanded to do unto others as you would have them do unto you but you will not always be treated as you would like to be treated. Christ-like love, it's not a two-way street. Because, thanks be to God, that's not how Jesus loves. Thanks be to God, that's not the way that Jesus loves, that's not the way that God loves. And Jesus was not loved in the way that he loved. Jesus' love is a sacrificial love. And Jesus was hated and persecuted and crucified for his selfless love. 
if that was the case, that God's love was conditioned on reciprocal love, on our love, if God's love was a two-way street, thanks be to God it's not, because you and I would still be condemned to hell. We haven't done anything to merit God's forgiveness for what we've done and the things that we continue to do. Paul says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And by this we know love. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It's not a reciprocal love. This is not a two-way street. There is nothing you and I can do to deserve or repay this kind of love, but we are called and commanded to love with this same kind of self-sacrificing love. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the law and the prophets, Jesus says. And he says in book in two, I will not recognize the lawless. Jesus will say to the lawless, I never knew you. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Who are these workers of lawlessness? He's told us here in the middle of this passage. These are those who will be found to have been false prophets. That is, false teachers, deceivers of the church. Those posing as Christian, but inwardly ravenous wolves out for their own gain. Jesus says, verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. They are those who prophesy and claim to do mighty works in the name of Christ, who look like they're doing good works in the name of Jesus, but will be found to have never actually known him. They are self-seekers. Jesus is challenging us here to reevaluate what truly is good fruit. Jesus says that many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do mighty works in your name. And Jesus says, you may have, but that's not the most important fruit. Jesus has been telling us for three chapters now in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not about the external works on the outside. It's about the heart on the inside. Love God. Love your neighbor. This is the summation of the law. Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, if I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, if I do any of these miraculous and great and impressive works, as impressive as they may be, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Does Jesus condemn the miraculous? He does not. Of course not. Jesus performs miracles. But for three chapters, Jesus has been trying to tell us what is truly righteous. What is good fruit. Heart-level righteousness, it looks like. Faithfulness, mercy, compassion, long-suffering, humility, peacemaking, love. Love pouring forth from a righteous heart, a heart that is in alignment with God in Christ. As one, verse 21, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's greater than any works, prophecy, exorcisms, miracles. To those who seek the gifts and the works without having the heart of Christ and the love that Jesus places in our heart by his spirit, Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers. Lawlessness. What we see in Jesus' teaching is there are different ways to reject the will of God and to head into destruction. Broad is the path. 
There are those who reject Christ outright. There are those who seek external works, but they don't have the more important changed heart. Those who enter the way of destruction are many. Broad is the way for rebels, self-righteous, self-gratifying, and the self-seeking. The path is hard that leads to life, but Jesus is calling. Enter the narrow gate. He tells us what this means, what this looks like. He's juxtaposed it against the things that it is not, that misunderstand or confuse what it is to follow Christ. And he's calling us into the narrow path and into the narrow gate, which is salvation in him. There is a way, Isaiah 35, 8 says, a highway, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. A wayfaring man, though a fool, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy, shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing. They shall flee away. And Jesus says, I am the way. Enter through the narrow gate. Jesus is called. That means we have a decision to make. Even if we've been in church all our lives today, we have a decision to make. As we've said, all of Scripture calls for a response. What am I going to do with God's Word, and what am I going to do with Jesus? Adrian Rogers points out, not only is there a decision to face, there is a direction to follow, and there is a destiny to find. Rogers continues, every road, it's going somewhere, and the one you're on right now is going somewhere. I want to ask this question, when I get to where I'm headed, where will I be? When I get to where I am headed, where will I be? Now the Lord again in a very narrow way said there are only two destinations. One he calls destruction, the other he calls life. A decision determines direction, and direction determines destiny. There is a way of holiness. Jesus said is a hard and narrow way that leads to life, but there is a broad way that leads to destruction. Rogers tells this story. I want to share it with you. It's a good one. Years ago in Chicago, there was a famous nightclub named the Gates of Hell. It's not so hard to imagine a nightclub named the Gates of Hell now as it probably was then. The club was named the Gates of Hell. One man, out on an evening on the town, he went to a policeman and he asked, how can I get to the Gates of Hell? This is a true club. You can look it up. On that same street where this nightclub was, was a church. And the church had a big cross out front. You know the name of the church? It was Calvary Church. So can you guess what the policeman told that man? You want to get to the gates of hell? Go right past Calvary, right past the cross, and you'll come to the gates of hell. Go right past the cross at Calvary, and you will get to the gates of hell. Calvary, the cross, where God has lifted up the bloodstained prince of glory, hanging in agony and in blood, and he says, stop, 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 or you'll end up at the gates of hell. There is a destiny to find. It may be a fearful destiny, or it may be a fabulous destiny to be found at the end of whatever way that you are on. It will be a final destiny, Jesus says. He says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. 
those who find it are few. The gate is wide. The way is broad and easy that leads to destruction. There is a way of holiness, a highway there, and it shall be for those who walk on the way. Jesus is the way. The righteous will follow the way that leads to life, and they will enter by the narrow gate. This passage, this is the altar call of Jesus' sermon. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been calling us to the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The righteousness without which you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says here, verse 21 and 22, it's not the one who does mighty works in the Lord's name. It's the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, who will enter the kingdom. Where is the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees to be found? It's in Christ. It's in the cross. Jesus is himself the way. And what is the will of the Father in heaven? That we follow him, saying, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. So he draws his sermon to a close. Jesus calls for a response. He calls us to arise, to follow him and to walk the narrow path. Not merely a narrow aisle in the church building. It might begin there. But a walk that doesn't end at the front of the church. But a walk that goes until you arrive at that eternal glorious destination. As Adrian Rogers pointed out, there is a decision facing us every day and there is a direction to follow and a destiny to find. When you get where you're going, where will you be? Decision determines direction, and direction determines destiny. Decision, destiny, the eternal glorious destination, or destruction. So why, as we said before, if the situation is so dire, do so many good preachers at so many good churches not give an altar call? Why do my mentors, people that pastored me, not give an altar call? While every message is delivered in the scripture by any of the prophets, any of the apostles, by Jesus himself always called for a response, always called people to repent and to turn and to flee from sin and darkness and to seek the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus is calling, is it because we're scared? Scared to call people to respond to change. Scared that people won't. That they'll reject the message and that they'll walk away. I don't think so. I don't think that's it at all. Or is it because perhaps that's not enough. It's not enough to leave you with the idea that making a one-time decision, walking an aisle, praying a prayer, maybe even getting baptized is the equivalent of giving your life to Jesus, of committing to a lifelong day-by-day commitment to every day, in every moment, choose to die to self, to take up your cross, to stick to following Jesus by loving God and loving others and entering by Christ, who is the narrow gate. Jesus isn't calling us to make a one-time walk down an aisle. He's calling us to day by day follow his way down the narrow path, which is hard. And when we fail, when we wander from the path, he's calling us to repent and get back on the path. Understand, life in Christ, to be a follower of Jesus, it's an ongoing lifelong discipleship relationship in which we are changed, transformed. We are grown up into Christ's likeness by the work of the Holy Spirit and the transforming grace of our good Father. Jesus is calling. He's giving us an invitation. Enter by the narrow gate. It's not enough to walk an aisle, to get a certificate from a pastor, to write the date in the back of your Bible, to slap an ictus fish on the back of your car, a Jesus bumper sticker on the tailgate of your life as you go trucking along with your own agenda. It's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, and to do many mighty works in his name. Entering by the narrow gate means placing your life in Jesus' hands. It means laying aside your will 
surrendering to the will of the Father in heaven. It's not a bumper sticker on the back of your life. It means Jesus drives every day. Where are we going today, Lord? We're going where he says we're going. We're leaving behind what he says we're leaving behind. And if he drives into persecution, opposition, things that bring trial, we go in trust. Because that's the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is perfect. And the Father is good. Jesus called. It's not an easy believism. It's not an easy, broad, and lazy way. His grace is not cheap, and it calls for a response. It's a daily taking up of a cross, a dying to sin, following him. It's a difficult way, a narrow way. Few will find it. Jesus is calling. It's not because we do these things that we somehow earn our way into God's good graces or It's not our doing these things that grant our admission through the narrow gate. We do these things because we actually know Jesus. Our hearts have been transformed by the grace of God. This is what the person who has truly been born again of the Holy Spirit desires to do. The person who has ears to hear, hears. The person who has eyes to see, sees. The person who knows Jesus sees the truth, hears the shepherd's voice, lays down their life, follows him down the narrow path, and through the narrow gate. It's not because that's what earns our entry. It's not because God has done something for us and now we do something for him. It's not reciprocal. It's because God has loved us. It's because God in his grace has pursued us and in his grace has sought us out and in his grace has He has called us, and we have been given eyes to see and ears to hear, and in our hearing, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice and long to rightly do the will of the Father. That's what faith is, to hear the call of Jesus, to respond and to follow him today, tomorrow, and every day until we reach our destination. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. Not everyone who knows the name of the Lord, who declares the name of the Lord, or even takes the name of the Lord, or does great works in the name of the Lord, will enter. But the one who perseveres to the end, doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. If you're on the broad path, if you've wandered from the narrow way, don't keep going. The cross is staring you in the face. Look around you. The whole earth is quaking. God is shaking the earth that the removing of what can be shaken will fall away so that what cannot be shaken remains. He's shaking the nations that they will come and fill his house with glory. God is calling saying, stop, stop, stop. Don't pass by the cross. Don't pass by Jesus. Don't wait until it's too late. Follow him. Get back on the path. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for sending your Son to die for us, for sending your spirit to indwell our hearts, for by your grace extending the call to us to get on the path. Father, I pray that we'd have eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would be a people who longs to follow your son all the days of our lives down the narrow path and enter into the kingdom of heaven by him, by his righteous justification of us, by your sanctification of us, by your spirit in making us like him. Father, that we would be grown up to be glorified for the purpose of glorifying you, our good father, in joy forever. 
by the aid of your spirit, and in the matchless authority of your Son, Jesus Christ, you, Father.